Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we bless your name today. We thank you because of this wonderful retreat we're going through. Thank you, Lord, because of the messages you are sending to us. And thank you, Lord, for your word that brings the power and the faith into every heart. Oh, Lord, we're praying at this time. You will reach every heart once again in your word. In Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that the victory that belongs to a child of God, the triumph that, begins, that belongs to a child of God, the conquest belonging to a child of God, you give to every one of your children in Jesus' name. Make us overcomers. Make us more than conquerors. We pray that in our life, we will be victorious every day of our lives in Jesus' name. Whatever the world throws at us, whatever the devil throws at us, what are the flesh may throw at us? Oh Lord, by your grace, by your strength, by the strength coming from Calvary, we're going to be successful and victorious and we're going to be more than conquerors in Jesus' name. And we'll pray, Lord, as we make us overcome day after day and week after week and month after month and year after year. Oh Lord, we'll pray on the final day when the saints go marching in, we'll be there with them in Jesus' name. Show us the path to victory. Show us, Lord, the way to, to triumph in every area of our lives in Jesus' name. And the things that overcame us before. We pray, oh Lord, you'll grant us victory over them in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. We're looking at Colossians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Colossians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in each. We're talking about the triumph of the believer, the total triumph of the believer, the conquest of the believer, the victory of the believer, the cross that guarantees our total triumph. The cross, the sacrifice, the crucified Christ, Calvary that guarantees the total triumph of every child of God. Guarantees a victory. Guarantees a conquest. Guarantees that whatever temptation or trial, whatever pressure and whatever the world may try to throw at us, we're going to be victorious. I said we're going to be victorious. And you know, it's because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. First of all, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances against us. All the things we did in the past that merited the judgment of God. All the things we did in the past, all the sins were committed. And the Bible said, the soul that sinned, it shall die. And because of that penalty laid upon us, we carried a heavy load. And Jesus said, I'll take that for you. I'll remove it away from you. And he went to the cross and he died. And that death at Calvary, that substitutionary death, then made God to blot out the handwriting of ordinances against us. All those things were contrary to us. And he took them out of the way. And then... The powers that led us to do evil, the principalities and the powers, he spoiled them, he destroyed them, he devastated them, and then it says he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them on the cross. Second Corinthians chapter two. We're looking at verse fourteen. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse fourteen. It says. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. You come into Christ by faith. You turn away from sin. You turn to Christ the Savior. 
and then as you come into Christ and you abide in Christ, a new creature in Christ, it says it gives us triumph every day, every moment, triumph. And it maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place, in every place. It means no matter where you are. Some people say we're living in the village and it's so difficult to live the victorious life. Every place. Other people say it's a city life that makes it difficult to live a triumphant life. It says in every place. Other people say I was a good Christian. I was victorious before I went to college. And since I got to college, university, the challenges there, there's so much. I cannot live the victorious life. It says in every place. Some children said when I was in the children's church, the teachers can testify I was victorious and triumphant. But since I went to secondary school, it's very difficult for me to live the, the, the right just life, the holy life, the victorious life. It says in every place. I have some young men there telling me that you know before they got married, they lived victorious life. They were victorious over sin. They were victorious over the flesh and over the world. And those young men are telling me that since they got married, they say pastor, pastor, I don't know about my marriage. It's very difficult to live a victorious life. It says in every place. Other people are saying, I think it's because I'm not married yet. When I get married, it will be so easy for me to live a righteous life, a holy life. Whether we're married or not, you can live the victorious life. Christ in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And it's the hope of victory. Will make you victorious in Jesus' name. Some people say, I'm living with my parents yet. I'm living with another brother, another sister. And this brother I'm living with, this sister I'm living with, is such a thorn in my flesh. I wish I could live alone. When I'm living alone, I know I'll be victorious. Other people say, when I was living with another person, we'll have quiet time together, devotion together, prayer together, fellowship together. And it was easy for me at that time to overcome temptation. I'm living alone now. And this uh, lonely life and days, aloofness of life makes it difficult for me to live a righteous life whether you are alone or with other people you can live a victorious life we're going to live victoriously in jesus name you know some people i'm just dreaming when they'll make me a worker i think when you're a worker it becomes easy to live a victorious life but you know i'm not a worker yet just a member of the church and because i'm just a member i don't know those secret things those workers know maybe that's why i'm not living the victorious life whether you are just a member or a minister a worker a leader whatever you are if you're in christ if you're born again if you're a child of god it can solve all those writings of ordinances against us and it says we'll live victoriously and we're going to be victorious in jesus name i think i'm hearing somebody saying over there you know before we had all these little children and family it was easy to live a victorious life but you know children came to the family and stand up there sit down there don't go there go there if i get on your nerves so much pastor how is a person that's a parent having all these teenagers growing up? How can we live a victorious life in every place, every situation, every condition of life when Christ is living on the inside of you? The grace of God, the strength of God, the power of the Lord in your life will make you to live victoriously in Jesus' name. I think, you know, some pastors are saying it's not even my children causing me a problem. It's the members of the church. The members of the church, you know, there are different levels of maturity. This one carries that, that one pulls that, that one draws that, that one drives that. And, you know, pastor, you're a pastor like me. How can you live the victorious life? I'm telling you that if anybody ought to live the victorious life, it's the pastor that must live a victorious life. And we're going to be victorious. I said we're going to be victorious. Victory is mine in Jesus' name. How about you? I said I about you. Victory is there for every one of us in Jesus' name. Because, because we can give thanks unto God that it makes us triumph in Christ. You are going to be triumphant in Jesus' name. And we're looking at the cross that guarantees total triumph. The cross that guarantees 
complete conquest is the cross that guarantees total obedience and total victory in our lives and we're going to be victorious in Jesus name there are three things we're going to consider number one the crisis of trials and temptations the crisis of trials and temptations show me any righteous man he has crisis of temptation in his life he doesn't fall to the temptation, but the crisis is there. The challenges are there. The difficulties are there. The conflicts are there. The crisis of trials and temptation. Number two, the condemnation of transgressors and tempters. The condemnation of transgressors and tempters. On the one hand, there are people who tempt you, and there is condemnation for them. Every tempter, every temptress has condemnation on him on her but then the people that transgress that yield to that temptation and they do not have the power and the strength that comes through our association with christ through our a kind of grace we have from the lord and they're not making use of the victory that the lord has given them there's the condemnation or the damnation and the punishment of the transgressors and the tempters number three his cross his cross for our trust and triumph praise the lord i come to tell you tonight you'll be victorious i said i came to tell you tonight you'll be victorious in jesus name because of his cross because of crucifixion, because of Calvary, because of the price he paid for you and for me. He tells us we can trust him. Because of that, we can't be triumphant. I will be triumphant and victorious in Jesus' name. Say it for yourself. I will be triumphant. I will be victorious. Through the strength of the Lord, you will be in Jesus' name. Number one, give it back to me. Tell me out loud, number one, the crisis of trials and temptations. You've heard about many people that live the Christian life, a righteous life, a holy life, a victorious life, a triumphant life. And I want to tell you, every one of them had trials. Every one of them had temptations. Every one of them had resist they could have given. They could have said, because of this, that's why I'm not victorious. Abraham, he had his crisis. Joseph, he had his crisis. Jacob, he had his crisis. Moses, he had his crisis. Joshua, he had his crisis. Caleb, he had his own crisis. David, he had his own crisis. I were talking about Samuel, he had his own crisis. You're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they had their own crisis. Job in the Old Testament had his own crisis in the, in the midst of the crisis of trials and temptations. Many of them were victorious. I am going to be victorious. I said I'm going to be victorious. Check up your life, check up your life. All this, I have this crisis, I have this uh, struggle, I have this challenge, I have this. Compare yourself with any of those people we have mentioned. You come on to the New Testament, Paul at his crisis. Peter at his crisis. James and John at their crisis. And think about all the others we read about in the New Testament. They had their crisis. And yet, in the midst of the crisis of trials and temptations, the Lord made them victorious. They were overcomers. I'm going to be an overcomer. Even the Lord Jesus Christ at the crisis of trial and temptation, trial and temptation. Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. And you will see that in the midst of it all, through it all, in that temptation, he had victory. And he has won that victory for you and for me. And we're going to have that same victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The devil is the tempter. He may use a Delilah, but the devil is the tempter. He may use an Achan, but the devil is a tempter. 
He may use Judas as Iscariot, but the devil is the tempter. It says he was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was up toward and hungered. And then it says, when the tempter came to him, said, If thou be the Son of God, look at that language, if thou be the Son of God, just at the end of chapter 3, the Almighty God spoke from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He wanted him to doubt his sonship. He wanted him to doubt the word of the Father. When the tempter comes, that's what he does. They make insinuations and suggestions for you to doubt your salvation. For you to doubt, to have, not to have assurance. If that be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. We never obey Satan. We never obey the tempter. We never obey the temptress. We never obey any of the servants of Satan. Oh, Jesus could make all those things bread. But if it came from the Father, he could make them bread. But because it's coming from the devil, whatever the devil tells you, don't obey. You will not obey the devil in Jesus' name. Always say no to the devil. He may say something that looks nice, that looks all right. Moses brought water out of the rock. Why don't you? Jesus multiplied bread. Why don't you? Jesus walked on the sea. Why not you? Jesus did this. Why don't you? If the suggestion of command is coming from the devil, it may appear to be a good thing. Anything coming from the devil, you will say no. I said you will say no. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. By every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him into the holy city, and he setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, he will not relent, he will not give up only with one temptation or two temptations. He's going to go on and on. You know why? Because the devil knows a particular secret that drops of water, drops of water on the same stone at the same spot, eventually may wear away the stone. He wants to wear you off. And then he says this now, if thou be the son of God, you say, no, I know I'm a child of God, Satan, shut up. Then he's going to come again, if thou be the son of God, I know I'm a child of God, Satan, shut up. Every time he comes, you will say no in Jesus' name. And so he said, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, you know, the, the devil mocks, you know how people mock. You do something, and then they try to do that. It's not that they want to live a righteous life, like you want to live righteous. They just want to mock you, and the devil now is going to mock. Because Jesus said, it is written. Aha, uh -huh, it is written. It is written. And so the devil came, and the devil said, it is written. Whatever they say, however they say it, whatever they do, however they do it, you will not yield. I said you will not yield. You know, I'm talking about the crisis of trial and temptation. This was a crisis. It was a distraction to the Lord Jesus Christ. He just received the Holy Ghost power. He just received the Holy Ghost in feeling in dwelling. The, the Holy Ghost came upon him like a dove. He shall actually go out now and begin to do the work the Father has sent him to do. But the devil will bring all these trials and all these temptations to distract our attention. But Jesus remained focused on the word and he said, it is written. And so he said, the angels will carry you in their hand, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said unto him, it is reaching again. And you know something, and you know when people mock you, you, you are like, if you are like the average person, you are likely to, you are likely to stop what they are mocking. You know, let's say for example, you say, it is reaching. And then the fellow wanting to mock you will say, it is reaching. Then you feel ashamed, you feel small, you feel you are caught down. And then when something comes now, you'll not say it is reaching anymore. If that thing is right, if that thing gives you victory, keep on saying it, it is reaching. 
I said, it is written. I said, it is written. And so Jesus said, it is written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, again the devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Aha, uh -huh, he wanted worship. He said, you know, all these things have been given to me and I can give them to you. I'm telling you something. If you're too eager to have something, it becomes a source of temptation. If you're too eager to grab this and grab that, it becomes a source of temptation. If you're too eager to have money, money becomes temptation. If you're too eager to have the praise of men, the praise of men will become a temptation. If you're too eager to have popularity, popularity will become a temptation. If you're too eager to have any substance, any material thing, the devil will know that this is what you want. Actually, all these kingdoms of the world, they belong to Christ. Temporarily, the devil seized them. Because the government shall be upon his shoulder. He is the one that will reign from sea to sea, from land to land, everywhere. But the devil now said, well, why go through the rigma road, all the paths of the cross and crucifixion and burial and death and burial and resurrection and ascension. And then you wait for all these thousands of years and then come back again and then overcome the Antichrist. That's a long journey. I can give everything to you right now. Say, go your way. I'm not going to have anything from the devil. That's why Jesus said, look at this now in verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. It is reaching. Everybody say, it is reaching. You know, they, they, they challenge us, they say deeper life every time. Bible, Bible, Bible. Yes, because that's how to overcome the temptation. That's how, why how to overcome the trial. When you know what is reaching. When you know what is reaching, when you know what is reaching, and every time the devil comes to bring temptation your way, you are able to say, it is reaching, therefore he said, it is reaching, thou shalt worship the Lord and thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And the devil, tell me, leaveth him. And the devil did what? He left him, he left him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. You see why many people don't overcome? The reason they don't overcome is that thing is like an idol to them. That thing, they want it so much. It may be gold, they want the gold so much. It may be silver, they want the silver so much. It may be treasure, they want the treasure so much. It may be the pleasure of the flesh, they want the pleasure of the flesh so much. It may be the praise of men, they want the praise of men so much. It may be politics, they want uh, politics voting so much. And they can do anything, anything you want too much. Anything you desire too much, anything, I must not lose this, I must not lose this, I must hold on to this, will become a source of temptation. But if you hold everything with a loose hand, if God wants it for me, if it's mine, God will give it to me. I don't have to sin to keep it. I don't have to yield to temptation to keep it. I don't have to obey the devil to keep it. Because I know it is reaching. That is mine and it is mine. It will not become a source of temptation to you. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're reading from verse 13. Here it says in verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. It says, There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. I said God is faithful. Who will also, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Some people say, my temptation was greater than my strength. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. I couldn't overcome that temptation. It was too much. The pressure was too much. The pool was too much. The dry, drawing force was too much. It drove me into it. It is not true because it says it will not permit you to be tempted more than you are able. But you will with the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. But look at this. Look at this in verse 14. Wherefore, my dear 
dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Don't let anything be an idol in your heart. If anything is an idol in your heart, money, success, certificate, do or die business. If I don't get it, I die. Wife, husband, children. If I don't get it, I don't know where I will go. Position, power office if i don't get it what will become of me anything that's an idol in your heart will become a source of temptation the devil will know that you hold that thing so dear more than eternal life that's why it says wherefore my dearly beloved flee from idolatry don't let any man any woman anything any substance be an idol in your heart you'll be victorious in jesus name in luke chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 13 Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 13. How we escape temptation. And then you see the people are not able to escape. It says in verse 13, They on the rock are they which, when they hear, they receive the word of joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, for a while believe. And in time of temptation, they fall away in time of temptation they fall away they receive the word of god they became born again they became children of god they say praise the lord i was in that place i gave my life to christ now on my way to heaven all of a sudden there is something they're still holding in their heart and the devil is a kind of waving that thing in front of them won't you have this won't you yes i want to have okay if you want to have it backslide if you want to have it then surrender if you want to have it then give up your faith and because they want that thing so much in the time of that temptation they fall away it will not happen to you i said it will not happen to you when you don't hold anything too dear anything that the devil wants to take let him take because god will give you something better in jesus name in first timothy chapter six first timothy chapter six i'm reading from verse nine First Timothy chapter 6, we're looking at verse 9. It says, but they that will be rich, they that by force I must be rich, they that say by force I must be a millionaire, by force I must have this and that, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition. When you yield to temptation, except God recovers you, except God restores you, if you die in that condition, that is damnation, destruction, and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of what? Tell me. Sometimes it's in the church. The love of money is the root of all evil. Sometimes it's in the family. It's in the family. It's, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Sometimes it's in the place of work. Because, okay, if you don't do this, how are you going to have promotion? If you don't do this, how are you going to have increase in salary? If you don't compromise like this and do this and do that, how are you going to have what you are asking for? Well, if it's not time yet in the sight of God, that's all right. Let them take what they have. You are not going to yield because what is money? What shall it profit a man? If he gain the whole world and he loses his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You will not sell your soul for money in Jesus name for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and they have but they, it says they have pierced themselves with many sorrows but thou O man of God flee these things you flee from them in Jesus name that was the destruction of a man called Achan called Achan money was too much for him he wanted it by all means. The goodly Babylonish garment was too much for him. He wanted it by all means. And he yielded to temptation and he lost his very life. I'm looking at Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. You know what we love too much? What we desire too much? What we pursue too much? 
will become will become an irresistible source of temptation for us you love that thing more than heaven you love that thing more than salvation you love that thing more than eternal life you love that thing more than holiness it will become a great source of temptation to you for Achan it was money you know for Joseph it could have been success it could have been success because you know the Lord made him to prosper there he was in a strange land he was in a strange land and then temptation came to do something wrong he could have been thinking ah how do I keep my success if this a woman reports me to the husband and tells anything negative about me, I'd lose my job. If this is what she wants. If that is what she wants, if I don't give it to her, I'm going to lose my success. If success becomes so predominant in your life, you're going to, you're going to yield to temptation. But thank God for Joseph, you'll be like Joseph. I said you'll be like Joseph. You know, David, you know, David, his own problem was pleasure, the pleasure of the flesh. And you saw that woman washing herself. That's why we have eyelids to close your eyes. Whatever you see, something you shouldn't see. Solomon, that was the problem. Adding woman unto woman, woman unto woman, that was the problem. The pleasure of the flesh, they just exalted that above eternal life, above their pleasing God. Look at Saul. It was victory. His own kind of an idol was victory. We are now going to the battlefield. Samuel has not come and if, if Samuel does not come, I lose the victory and victory is all in all. Victory in battle, that's all in all. You see, what to make an all in all in your life? It's going to make you yield to temptation. And then we have Jeroboam, position and power. That was his own problem. All these people, if they go on to Jerusalem to worship, then they will remember David and then their mind will go after David and I want to keep this position, my royal position. I want to keep my place on the throne. If you know position is too much for you and that is what you want. I want to be a pastor. I want to be an overseer. I want to be a king. I want to be a leader. I want to be this. I want to be that. If that is too much in your mind, it will make you to yield to temptation. But when you say, it's God who promotes one. And it's God that brings down the other one. If God wants the position for me, all right. If he doesn't want it for me, Lazarus went to heaven. Even though he was poor and he was full of sores. If I have the position, okay. If I don't have it, that's all right. That's how to get to heaven. But the people that hold on to that thing, by all means, for Ahab, it was possession. Now, but can you give me your vineyard? I'm sorry, I cannot do that. It's the inheritance of my fathers. And this king, he wanted that vineyard so much. He wanted that heritage so much. The inheritance of another person. If possession is an idol in your heart, whatever the possession may be, I must have it. I must have it. I must have it. It becomes an idol. And then the devil will use that as a kind of source of temptation. Do you remember Annas and Sapphira? It was the praise of men. Everybody is coming to their, uh, to their apostle and then as they come, they lay down what they have and the apostle say, praise the Lord. There's Barsabbas there. There's so and so there. They sold everything and they came and they laid it down at the apostle's feet. And this uh, man, Ananiah, and the wife Sapphira, they all wa also wanted to have the praise of men. If the praise of men a flattery is your own thing. You want people to flatter you and you want to be in their good book. It becomes a source of temptation. And so they sold what they had and brought half of the price, part of the price. And Peter the apostle said, tell me, is it all? And because he wanted a good mark, he wanted praise of me. He said, that's all. And Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart? to lie unto the Holy Ghost. While she's remained, was it not yours? Why are you lying? What do you want? And then he dropped dead right there. And then the wife who have agreed together, what I say is what you say. I'm going to tell the apostles this. If they call you to check up, say the same thing. And the wife came three hours later. Tell me, wife, is it so much you sold the land? He didn't know what had happened to the what had happened to the husband. By the way, by the way, that man died, and there was no big ceremony of funeral service. 
There was no, you know, making noise about it. They even buried the man and it was a member of that church. Nobody even knew that anything, even the wife did not do anything and happened. You know, today, we want to make noise, let them hear over there and hear over there and hear over there. It's not necessary. Follow the Bible. And so eventually she came. Is this so much you sold the land? Aha, uh -huh. me and my husband were going to have a good name among these people. Or oh, they will know that we surrendered everything. Yes, so much. Uh -huh. Why did you agree together to tempt the Holy Ghost? Look, the feet of the people that carried out your husband will carry you out as well. She dropped down and she died because, because of looking for the praise of men. Do you remember Herod? It's because, you know, John said, Herod, you have your own wife and you are taking the wife of Philip, your brother. It is not right. And Herodias, what was in her mind, I must have Herod. I must have Herod. But that became a source of temptation. And Herod, I must have Herodias. That became a source of temptation. If whatever it is that is so pronounced in your mind, I must have, I must have, I must have. The devil will use that and tie a rope around you and pull you back into the world and from the world back into hell. God forbid it will not happen to you. That means then you will take everything away from your heart. If anything you see, you say, Oh Lord, if you give me, all right. If you don't give me, that's all right. Joshua chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 11. Joshua chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 11. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their cursed sin, and they have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except she destroy their cursed sin from among you. You know the story. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. When I saw, that's the problem. When I saw, that's the problem. When I saw, when they see money, if money is the idol in there, they cannot take their eyes away from the money. When they see a lady in the bus on the street, any of these are daughters of the other side. If that is the idol in their heart, they cannot take their eyes away from that. When they see a man, a man coming from the other side, from the devil, from all from the world. If that's the idol in the heart, they cannot take their mind away from that. And when they see position, advertisement, advertise there, even if it will take them away from Bible study, take them away from church, take them away from worship, if that is the idol in the heart, they cannot take their mind away from that. When I saw, I pray God will control your eyes. And your eyes will not be a source of temptation to you, a source of destruction to you in Jesus' name. Verse 21, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. I saw, I saw, I saw, I coveted them and took them. Seen. You know, see, there's nothing bad in seeing. We cannot walk around, you know, closing our eyes. You'll see a lot of things inside you. If it wants to enter your heart, if it wants to pull you away from the kingdom, you turn away your eyes away from that. But then the man kept on looking and kept on looking. I saw and I coveted. And then from the covetousness, that the thought in their heart, if I could have that, if I could possess that, if I could take that, if I could own that, if this could be mine, I coveted and took them, and took them, and took them, is one step after the other, one step after the other, the crisis of trial and temptation. Then he says, and behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. I pray that God will deliver you in Jesus' name. 
and we're looking at we're looking at uh, first kings first kings chapter 11 first kings chapter 11 you know there are some men they're not satisfied with only their wife only their wife but they must have another one have another one have another one look at uh, first kings chapter 11 i'm reading here from verse i'm reading from verse 4 from verse 4 it says in verse 4 for it came to pass when solomon was tell me i can't hear you when solomon was old I thought that, you know, when a man is young, he might have temptation. If even young people that have the temp temptation, they seem able to control themselves. But now in the case of Solomon, what a pity for this man. When Solomon was old, you know the meaning of that? He had reached the book of Proverbs already. And all, the, all that book of wisdom, he has given it to the world. But he was not reading. He was not reading. He's not writing. And when he was old, after God had used him, when he was old, after God had made him to write all those wonderful proverbs in the book of Proverbs, when he was old, it says when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord is God, as was the heart of David his father. You see that? It was the temptation of the pleasure of the flesh that drew him to that. I pray God will deliver you in Jesus. Jesus name. I didn't hear you. I said God will deliver you in Jesus name. Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse. I'm reading from chapter 2 of Job. Job chapter 2. Let's see what he say from verse 7. You know what Job went through? What Job went through? And by the grace of God, you know chapter 1. All the challenges that came. That could have been a source of temptation and trial. You know, all the children, the house collapsed on them and they all died in one day. Not only that, all his cattle, everything burnt together in one day. And yet, with all the destruction, devastation, and everything that he lost, he still said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and naked will I go to the Lord. And that did not bother him at all. But now come to chapter 2, the devil came again from verse 7. It says, so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And smote Job with soft boils from the, from the sole of his foot, even unto his crown, that is, on top of his head. And he took him, he put shed to scrape himself with her. And it says, and he sat down among the ashes. You know, all that did not bother Job. He said, it's just for a time. It's just for a time. The flesh is gone, but my soul is still connected with the Lord. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And then now look at verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Does thou still retain thine integrity? Cause God and die. Does thou still retain thy integrity? Cause God and die. You see, this Job, he was going to follow the Lord. It doesn't matter, you know, what was happening. He was going to go on and on. And you know why we get married? We get married so we can have a help meet. Somebody to encourage us. Somebody to help us on. So that whatever burden we bear, I and my wife, you and your wife, you and your husband, you bear the burden together. In the case of Job, the wife looked at him and said, look at this man. Look at his condition. And as long as this man is still alive, I cannot marry another person. And, you know, am I going to stick to this one until I die? And then he said, I know that if he causes God, then he will die. He said, Job, are you still retaining your integrity? Cause God and die. So at least if you are gone, then I'll be free to do whatever I want to do. A source of temptation. I pray God will deliver you in Jesus' name. You know, some people cannot bear that because they take the wife as an idol. Take, they take the husband as an idol. And because of the idolatry, the husband has idol, the wife has idol. Whatever the wife is saying, whatever the husband is saying, say, oh God, I wanted to serve you. I wanted to put everything on the altar. But look at what my husband is saying. Look at what my wife is saying. We will stand in Jesus' name. Look at Job in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his leaves. In all this did not Job sin with his leaves. I pray that you will not sin in Jesus' name. 
the crisis of trial may be there the crisis of temptation will be there you want to take your stand and you want to love God above yourself love God above your wife love God above your husband love God above your position love God above your possession love God above anything on earth it is that supreme love it's that sacred love unto God that keeps us in the hour of trial in the hour of temptation and we're able to remain victorious and we're able to remain conquerors we're able to remain triumphant we will be triumphant in Jesus name you know at another time is you know people cannot be you know temptation can come in a fellowship temptation can come in a ministry look at Jeremiah chapter 35 Jeremiah chapter 35 and I'm reading here from verse 1 Jeremiah chapter 35 I'm reading from verse 1 the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah saying Go unto the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jezaniah, I the son of Jeremiah, go on to verse, go on to verse 4. And I brought them, the Rechabites, into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Messiah, the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I said before the sons of the house of the Rechabites, pause full of wine and cups. And I said unto them, drink ye wine. Jemah was a prophet. And the Rechabites did not know that God was testing them. So that Jeremiah said, drink wine. You know, some people say, ah, our church will not allow that. Why it not because of our church? I will do that. Other people will say, I'm a worker in the church. Why it not that I'm a worker in the church? I would have done that. Other people will say, if my church hears that, they will discipline me. And because of discipline, I don't want all that kind of public discipline grace if it were not like that i would have yielded not because of heaven that's not why you're standing not because of your love for christ that's not what you are standing it's not because of devotion your devotion to the lord i promise the lord i open my mouth to the lord i'm going to follow him all the way through not because of that but because of church because if they hear because if they know I'm feeling the pull, I'm feeling the drag, but if they hear, they will do something. Not that. If you're going to serve the Lord, it means you really want to take your stand. You will take your stand in Jesus' name. I said you'll take your stand in Jesus' name. Whatever the trial, whatever the temptation, whatever the source of that temptation may be, when you know that you are your way to heaven and the devil is trying to get you away from heaven and say, I am not going to deviate, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to compromise, I'm going to take my stand. A Jeremiah may come, what does it matter? A king like Jehovah may invite you, what does it matter? The old prophet may call you to come back and do what you said, you will not do. You said, I've opened my mouth to the Lord. What does it matter? Who is tempting you? These people say, look at what they said when he said, I drink ye wine in verse 6. But they said, we will drink no wine. We will drink no wine for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your, nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, nor have any. And then he says, and all your days ye shall dwell in tents, that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab the son of Rechab our father in all that he has charged us to drink no wine all our days we and our wives we and our wives we and our wives if you're properly married your wife must have the same conviction with you if you're properly married your husband must have the same conviction with you if you're properly married your whole family must have the same conviction with you the conviction you have had before you're married you keep that conviction it's not that you know brethren i'm sorry i'm married now and you know this married life if you're going to keep your family you must bend here and bend here and compromise there and see a little here and cheat a little there it will not happen to you i said it will not happen to you 
They said, even we and our wives and then our sons, all the days of our lives who have obeyed the Lord. And as you read the Bible, you see how God blessed them and the Lord will bless us in Jesus' name. When you endure temptation, when you overcome temptation, and when you take your stand, because of that taking your stand, the Lord himself will be with you forever in Jesus' name. We're looking at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse trials, diverse temptation, diverse challenges. Knowing this, that the, the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, lacking nothing. What if you yield to temptation? You just fall on your back. I'm helpless, I'm impotent, I'm powerless. I'm graceless. I cannot overcome this. Any little sin will pull you down. What if that happens? Point number two now. The condemnation of transgressors and tempters. The condemnation of tempters and, uh, and, uh, and transgressors. We're looking at James chapter 1 verse 13. James chapter 1 verse 13. It says, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lost and enticed. And then it says, and then when lost as conceived. It bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Bringeth forth death. That theme brings death eventually. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 13. First Chronicles chapter 10. We're looking at verse 13. First Chronicles chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 13. First Chronicles 10 verse 13. So Saul died for his transgression. The condemnation of the transgressors. And so Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. You see, there are some people, any little sickness, and once they prayed, and one or two days they are not healed yet, then they go to all these uh, witch doctors, and they go to all these, uh, you know, uh, backyard uh, prophetess, and all that robbing them and putting this and that and then they sell themselves into the hands of the of the sorcerers and the soothsayers just because of getting well if health becomes an idol if getting well becomes an idol that you can just go any i want to get healed i want to get healed i have sickness that's why i'm running here and there if you die in that condition what story will you tell in eternity i pray that you'll not die in that condition in jesus name stay with the lord stay with the lord there is healing with the lord if he has not healed you today I about tomorrow look at that man in acts of the apostles chapter 3 they carried him to the gate of the temple. He was 40 years old already. All the time Jesus Christ was in Jerusalem, healing days and healing everybody everywhere. The man did not get healed. But he kept on uh, carrying me there, carrying me there, carrying me there. One day, your own day will come. I said, one day, your own day will come. You know, all the time of the great healing ministry of Jesus Christ, the man had not been healed yet. And then eventually now Peter and John, they got to that temple and then they got to the gate and the man was looking at them and his own day had come. His own day had come. I pray that one day, your own day will come in Jesus' name. They said, look on all silver and gold. Am I none in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Rise up and walk. And he rose up and he walked because his day came. Don't go to the witch doctors. Don't sell your soul into the hands of the servants of the devil. Just because of healing, your day will come in Jesus' name. Don't yield to temptation. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. The time of temptation. The time of trial. That you will stand. You will stand. And then you will, you know, when the Lord comes, you will go in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, and in not your hearts, as in the day, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. 
in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my way so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my race think about that think about that he said because of yielding to temptation in the wilderness the Lord said they will not enter into my rest that's what the Lord is telling us in verse 12 take heed brethren take heed brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God lest there be something inside your heart that you, you cherish so much, that you want so much. And then when that thing, when it is with the devil, in the hands of the devil, and the devil is saying, come and get it, come and get it. You say, well, bye-bye church, bye-bye some doctrine, bye-bye Christ, bye-bye eternal life. I want to go and get that thing from that person that is calling me. I pray you will not lose your soul in the hands of Satan in Jesus' name. That's why I say, take it there for brethren. Uh, it says, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you uh, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Holding the beginning steadfast unto the end. How about the people that are tempters and tempters? not just the people that are transgressors, the people that make other people to fall into sin, the people that make other people to abandon the way of heaven. What happens to them? Look at Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 23. We're looking at verse 13. Matthew chapter 23. And we're reading from verse 13. It says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You see, they didn't allow people to believe. Some people that believe, they feared the Pharisees. They feared the scribes because they will turn them away from the synagogue. Those people themselves had their own problem because they love the praise of men more than the honor coming from God only. But these Pharisees were the stumbling block. They were not entering into the kingdom. Neither will they, they will not go in as verse 13. Neither suffer ye them that are entering in to go in. Look at verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, one convert, one religious traditionalist. And then when he is made, he, he, he make him to fold more the child of hell than yourselves. What's the condemnation? What's the result of that? Look at verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? The tempters, the temptresses, how can you escape the damnation of hell? I pray the Lord will grant us repentance in Jesus' name. I say God will grant us repentance in Jesus' name. When you say damnation of hell, what's the meaning of that? Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, we're reading from verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Prepared for who? Prepared for who? For the devil and his angels. I'm going to have victory. I said I'm going to have victory. I said I'm going to have the victory. How do we have the victory? How do we have the victory? It's cross for our trust and triumph. It's cross, it's cross for our trust and triumph. All those temptations you can overcome. All those trials you can overcome. All the, all the pressure coming from the devil and agents of Satan you can overcome. You are going to overcome in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Should taste death for every man. That's why it says now in verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering, 
and then in verse 18 for in that he himself uh, had suffered being tempted he is able he is able he is able to succor them to support them to sustain them to strengthen them that are tempted he is able he will strengthen you in jesus name we're looking at chapter 4 verse 14 chapter 4 verse 14 seeing then that we have a great high priest who is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our profession our confession our faith our trust in the lord let us hold fast our profession for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin that's a forerunner that is the captain of our salvation. That's our savior. And because he overcame, we're going to overcome in Jesus' name. Let us therefore, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Find grace to help in time of need. As you come to Christ, he'll give you the power to overcome temptation. But you lay everything upon the altar. You say, Lord, I love you more than anything on earth more than anyone on earth i'm not going to allow money i'm not going to allow gold and silver i'm not going to allow job i'm not going to allow certificate i'm not going to allow success i'm not going to allow victory i'm not going to allow inheritance i'm not going to allow anything to take my heart away from you once you lay everything on the altar like that the grace of god will flow into your heart in jesus name and then you'll find that he is able able to sustain you able to help you to hold on to the very end hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. That's talking about our Savior. That's talking about the one who strengthens us. That's talking about the one that gives us the grace. The grace to overcome. He is able to save them to the uttermost. That come unto God by him. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. In verse 26. For such an high priest became us. Who is holy and harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens and if we trust him he'll keep us i said he will keep us look at chapter 12 of hebrews hebrews chapter 12 we're reading here from verse 1 they start to have the victory when you surrender your life to the lord jesus christ and every object of temptation you throw it away from your life it says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight let us lay aside every weight let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross he despised the shame and he set at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him consider Christ anytime you have temptation consider him anytime you have trial consider him anytime you have the pull of the world wanting to pull you back into the world consider him for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin that's why it says in verse 12 look at verse 12 wherefore lift up the hands that which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed let it rather be healed there's inner healing spiritual healing your soul's healing your spirit's healing here tonight it will strengthen you in jesus name and then in verse 14 follow peace with all men follow peace with all men but not at the expense of your soul Follow peace with all men. You know, many people, they just read, follow peace with all men. They don't understand. They think it means follow peace with the Pharisees and 
follow peace with the Sadducees and follow peace with, uh, you know, Simon the sorcerer and follow peace with the servant of that deputy, the sorcerer, and follow peace with that damsel. These are the men of God, servants of God, shown on towards the way of salvation and follow peace with all the backsliders, follow peace with Judas and Scott. No! Follow peace with all men in such a way that it doesn't deprive you of life eternal, of your soul's salvation. It's not just follow peace with idolater, follow peace with the idol worshiper, follow peace with all the compromisers, follow peace with all the drunkards, follow peace with all the people that want to pull you down and then you are not taking your stand. You follow peace with all men in so much as it doesn't take away your salvation. It doesn't take away your sanctification. It doesn't take away heaven out of your hand. And in so much as it doesn't tamper with your salvation, follow peace with all men. In so much as it doesn't tamper with the calling of God upon your life, follow peace with all men. And then holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You'll possess this holiness in Jesus' name. Look at verse 15. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of of God, lest any, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or, or profane person as Esau, who for one muscle of meat sold his birthright. He is so at the challenge. He had the challenge for one muscle of meat he sold his birthright. I pray you'll not sell your salvation. You'll not sell your soul and your ticket to heaven. You'll not transfer it for all the things that glitter in the world in Jesus' name. In verse 17, for ye know that how, how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. We're not going to allow anything, anything to make us backslide or to make us drop everything good thing that the Lord has given us in Jesus' name. Before we pray, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure I mean this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone, let everyone, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Do what? Depart from iniquity. Sometimes you just get up and you gently walk away. Other times you have to flee. You have to run. Like Joseph had to run away from that situation of temptation. And I pray that when your own time comes, that temptation, the tempter is knocking at the door. And the temptress is knocking at the door. You will remember that the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And everyone that nameth the name of Christ will do what? Tell me out loud, we'll do what? We'll depart from iniquity. Let's rise up and tell the Lord, grant me the grace. Grant me the grace. When Satan is knocking at the door, help me, Lord, to know when to flee. Help me, Lord, give me the grace. When Satan is knocking at the door, when the temptress is knocking at the door, when the tempter is knocking at the door, help me, Lord, that I will take my stand. I will flee. I will flee. I will flee from evil because the Lord is about to come. It's the people that hold on to the end. Those are the people that are going to be temptations will come, trials will come, difficulties will come, challenges will come. But if you know that you're a real child of God, you love God above anything, anyone on earth, you lay everything upon the altar, then you're saying, oh Lord, have mercy on me, oh Lord, have mercy on me, grant me your grace, grant me your grace, so that I will keep the victory. Open your mouth and pray, open your mouth and pray. I want to keep the victory, I want to keep the victory, I want to keep the victory. You'll keep the victory in Jesus' name. Him. Talk to the Lord, talk to the Lord. Temptations are there. What's Satan trying to use to pull you back into the world? What's the devil trying to use to pull you back into, into, the, into your old vomit? Is he using money like you say for Achan? Success, pleasure, victory, position, power, possession, praise of men. What's he using? You tell the Lord, whatever it is and whoever it is, you'll stand. 
you stand. Make up your mind. The devil is not going to just open his eyes. Say, okay, you want to pass, you want to go to heaven, be on your way. The devil is not going to encourage you. He will use whatever he can use. He'll use whoever he can use. But you will say no. Every time you say no, because I know it is written. Yield not to temptation for yielding is sin. Every victory will prepare you for the next victory. Make up your mind and take your stand. I will stand. I will stand. I will stand. Tell the Lord you will stand. Let the Lord help you. He has grace, enough mercy, enough. His power can make you true. Make you stand true, stand faithful, stand upright. His help, his companionship will help you. Help you to stand. With every temptation, he'll make a way of escape. That you will be able to stand. You remember how Samson was pulled down? There was a Delilah employed by his enemies. Employed by the Philistines. Trick him. Deceive him. Know the secret of his power. She got something. Praise the Lord, they'll not get you. Pray to the Lord, they will not get you. They got Solomon. Tell the Lord, they'll not get you. The money was too strong for Achan. Pray. Now whatever it is will not be too strong for you. You will stand. You will stand. Surrender your heart all over again to the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever is competing with the love of Christ in your heart, tell the Lord. And say, Lord, I love you more than money. I love you more than silver and gold. I love you more than the flesh. I love you more than position. I love you more than power. I love you more than the praise of men. Lay everything upon the altar. Lay everything upon the altar. The Lord will help you and see you through.